welcome. Um, I'm really excited that all of you guys came today to hear me talk. So my name's Kate Matsudaira. I am the VP of Engineering and CTO at SEO Moss. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, scaling a Rails app. So I'm going to start with what the punchline is of my talk, because I think that this will really summarize what I'm going to talk about. And for those of you who are interested in other things, it will give you a chance to go listen to someone else. So in my opinion, uh, scaling is most often affected by how you design your software and how you model and access your data. Trying to optimize technologies like Ruby and Rails and squeak as much performance, yeah, stuff like that is interesting, um, but it's not always manageable or scalable. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. So if that's what you want to hear, I'm sorry to disappoint you, um, but you still may find what I have to say interesting. So let's get started. So I'm going to talk about and tell you our stories. So at SEMOS, we, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do, but this is a story about failure. <laughs> and it's a story about mistakes. And hopefully you'll be able to learn from some of those things uh, as I, we go along. But um, I will tell you that my, the best part of my presentation is probably the slides. So if you can't read them, I'd suggest moving up. I won't be offended if you get up and leave, but I would say uh, you might not be able to read them from way in the back. So let's start with the first part. So, you know, this is about Rails. So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about Rails? Uh, and Ruby on Rails specifically. Um, so for me, when I think about it, I think about it as being easy. Um, the first time I tried Ruby on Rails, I had something up and working in less than three hours. That was really exciting. It's very hard to replicate that sort of thing with, say, Java or C++. But the challenge when something is really easy or really fast and fun is that, um, it abstracts a lot of the hard stuff from you and makes it easy. So there can be a lot of challenges when it comes to scaling or making the most around these sorts of applications. So let me tell you a little bit about who SEOMOS is, only in the context of what you'll need to understand for this presentation. For what it's worth, none of you are probably our customers, so um, you don't have to worry about a sales pitch. So we build tools for internet marketers. We deal with a lot of data. Um, the company started as a consulting company, a marketing consulting company, and they started building tools to help them do software. And people started buying their tools, other consultants, things like that, to help them do their SEO and, and increase their marketing. So in 2009, we said, look, we're really onto something, and the software uh, ended up being more profitable than our consulting business, so we headed in that direction. And this is where our story begins. See, we had been building tools for several years, mostly around helping us do our consulting. And these were the types of tools where you put a job on Odesk and, or Elance and people do the work for you. So what you end up with is 20 different interfaces, 20 different technology stacks. And, and we thought to ourselves, well, what if we put it all together, right? So it all worked and functioned. And so that's what we built. If you go to our homepage, it's a screenshot of basically our web app. And it's built in Ruby. And so this is kind of what the story is about. So let's talk about what the V1 is. So the V1 was initially built using a technology called MERB. How many people in this room have even heard of MERB? Go ahead and show your hands. OK, a few of you. It's more than most people. Um, so MERB and Rails eventually, well, Rails 3 took the good parts of MERB, and that is, or Rails 2 took the good parts of MERB, and that became Rails 3. But we tried to build it on MERB before that happened. And this meant we had a very shaky foundation. After patching three different bugs in the framework, we realized that this was not something we wanted to build our business on because we weren't Indiana Jones or anything, so crossing that bridge was a bit daunting. So this is the first lesson of my talk, and I think this is an important one, is that don't choose a technology because of the features. I mean, features are important, but equally important are things like how do other people use it? Does it have an active community? Has it been tested? Um, my favorite litmus test when picking libraries or technologies is just to Google it. Um, if you Google MERB, you'll get about 1 million results. If you do the same thing for Ruby on Rails, you get 22 million. Um, this should give you an idea when picking uh, your framework, which one you should probably pick. So we made the call to switch from MERB to Rails. And this, keep in mind that we were a startup, right? And at the time, we were kind of a, like a, a little what's the word I'm looking for? A small business that we were looking to grow, right? So we had this vision, 
And we wanted to start, and we had already built this prototype in MERB. And then we realized, okay, we've got to rewrite in Rails. But in order to make our same timeline, right, this is like a six-month project, we're not talking years, um, we had two choices. We could either slip our launch date or try to work our asses off to still make the same launch date. And since we were a startup, we chose B and just worked incredibly hard. But we thought this should be easy, right? We have the tools, we're taking tools that we've already built, we built another version of it, right? We have our version in MERB, so building it a third time, like we should be able to do this quickly. But this also meant that we made a lot of shortcuts that you'll hear about kind of as we go. Um, and so it was a good week before launch and literally we hadn't been testing much right before launch because it's like we didn't have a lot of time, we're trying to build out the functionality. And so we start testing and we realize there's two bad assumptions built into our software already. And this is before we've even launched. Um, so the first assumption was there was a miscommunication. This is something I'm sure happened to you a lot of you. This is one of my favorite uh, comics, by the way. It's this notion of the customer asks for a swing and the, everyone kind of envisions it in a different way. Well, that happened to us. Um, we had a notion that we wanted our website crawled. Really simple, the customer wants to crawl the website detect things like SEO issues. So here's the one SEO tip for the presentation for people. Um, one of the things that we do is compute duplicate content. So if you have a really big site, uh, search engines don't know which web page to rank if they're too similar. So you have to canonicalize those pages. So one of the things we'll do is we'll crawl a big site, look at how similar the pages are and report on those types of errors. And so that was you know, the genesis of this feature, among other types of SEO or uh, site architecture issues. So what we built was 10,000 pages per week. We feared most sites were probably that. That was the number that was in the designs around the new pr uh, product SKUs. So that was how it was built. But actually, in this 20-page requirement doc that the product managers generated but no one actually read, we were supposed to crawl 1 million pages per week. So imagine the different sort of data schemas you would have for something where you're adding 10,000 new rows per customer every week versus a million. Or even just computing duplicate content across 10,000 pages versus a million pages. With 10,000, you could probably fit them all in memory. With a million, it's not even possible. So it's a different architecture. The other fatal flaw that we had in our uh, technical design and assumptions was that we had used the past to predict the future. Now I've mentioned twice that we had these tools already in existence. So we had this old keyword tool that tracked over two years 85,000 keywords across all our user base. So we thought, okay, assuming that we are way more popular and we're gonna track a lot more keywords, let's assume that we'll handle at most two million keywords. Because that seemed way bigger than what we had accumulated over two years. But actually, in the first week alone, we had over 800,000 because our CEO did this blog post that told everyone, instead of saying take the keywords that you care about, go into Google Analytics and look at every keyword that drives you traffic and paste it into our tool. <laughs> so this is, this is what we saw when we found this out. But it was too late, right? So what did we do? So we had to decide, do we launch or not launch? And we ended up launching, and so we're here. Although it really felt like here. Um, <laughs> because it, the impending doom, right? Um, and this is what we launched, and uh, pardon the awesome PowerPoint architecture, but uh, at a high level, we have a basic well Rails app, we call it Turbo, is our code name. A database is just MySQL with standard replication. We have a jobable framework, which is really just a fancy uh, job management on top of RabbitMQ. And then that pulls in and gets work from a fleet of crawlers that are crawling people's sites and computing issues on them, and the keywords collecting data um, on keywords and rankings. So that's what we launched and the data started growing because you can imagine we've got these crazy bad assumptions in our data model and our app performance was terrible. And, but people liked it, so that was good. Um, people were using it. We were getting lots of complaints that our app was slow um, but they, and they just wanted it to be faster, but that was good. And so from a business perspective, this was awesome. Uh, the blue line is our churn. So SEO is actually a heavy churn industry because most people do SEO and then they're done. And so there's no reason to pay a monthly fee. So we were, have always been fighting against this. But when we launched this product, because of the monthly tracking, like our churn went way down, 
our memberships went way up, and this was huge for the business. So the moral of the story is you still should launch. So even if you have a bad product or it's not perfect, um, you should launch anyway. But let's get to the part. Let's, so we launched this thing and it's not working. So when customers are complaining, the first thing you want to do is address it. So that's where we started, is let's scale the reads on our database and get the data rendering faster. The easiest thing you can do, right, is disable stuff. So that's what we started doing. We just chopped features off, disabled things in the UI. So we had this overview section with like graphs and counts. We deleted all, we disabled all of those because what we needed to do was pre-compute that data. Because you see each of these counts, it probably is hard to see, but um, in the little colored boxes, those were generated um, by actually scanning over the whole rows of data um, for that campaign. And so that was very inefficient. So pre-computation is a lot like data compression. When you compress data, you're taking a large amount of data and putting it in a smaller space. But pre-computation is the same thing, but just applied to time. And so you're trying to take all of this work that you're doing and put it in, in a small amount of space. So for example, if you have millions and millions of lines of data and you want to count the number of errors occurring, instead of scanning over that million lines, when you write the lines, instead compute a count and write that number. So then instead of doing select count you know, from, instead you're doing just select and the count is already written in your database. It's a much faster query. This is the same principle they use with stock markets, right? So here's an hourly graph um, of some stock symbols, but when you generate the yearly graph, you're obviously not using the same data that you would for the hourly, because that would just be too many data points. So you pre-compute some aggregate set, right? You guys get this. So this is another lesson, pre-compute your data. So if you want faster lookups, you need to make sure that you're pre-computing ahead of time. Now this takes more time up front, but it makes reads much faster. Another problem that we had, and I think that this, can, this is applicable to not just Rails, but any sort of uh, language with a rich database abstraction layer, is that it's really easy to fall into pitfalls and not really understand what's going on. So for us, we, you know, in all the beauty of Active Record, just wrote things that should have worked, but they actually look like this. So as we started looking at the SQL, what you'll see in this graph, the two bottom parts are purple and brown. Those were SQL queries generated by Active Record that were actually just incredibly inefficient. And so if you use any sort of database abstraction layer, make sure you're looking under the covers to really know what's going on and make sure that what you're, what's happening isn't hindering your performance. So another interesting problem that we had is we had someone on our team who had a lot of experience with Oracle. And we it, we're using MySQL. <laughs> and MySQL and Oracle are really not similar. And so when we were looking through the code that had been written, we see really innocuous statements like this, which is, you know, you select a campaign, sort it by ascending order. This seems very simple. It's not complicated. There's no crazy joins, nothing. So here's the view that this generates in MySQL. And, and the details are not as important. But what this view does is it generates these other views. And these views, oh wait, <laughs> there's more, the nine views. Holy moly, that is a lot of queries for that one little select statement. Um, so when you think about what you're building, make sure you understand the limitations of your technology and the limitations of your database. So after all that, we finally got our app back and running and things were working and customers were happy and so we were moving along. So here we are on our timeline, we've launched, we've made all these read optimizations. But here's the thing about read optimizations, is that it makes writes really slow. <laughs> because now you're writing indexes, it takes longer to do insertions, and all this pre-computation I was talking about earlier, yeah, that takes time too. And so here's our architecture, right? And I mentioned this earlier, we have this event layer managing all these jobs, taking in all these data from all of our keywords, and all the data from our crawls. And so normally, Rabbit looks something like this, right? You see seven different kind of jobs as it fills each day of the week. But what we saw was this. <laughs> we weren't actually able to complete the day's jobs in 24 hours. So then with reads, you know, that was just, the it wasn't performant. But with this, we actually weren't delivering our promise to our customers to get their data every week. And so this was a real problem. 
So this caused the team to be super operational and lots of pagers and lots of weekends. Um, but here's some of the things we did. So one of the first things we did was we removed transactions. Um, almost every job in that jobable queue had a transaction wrapped around it because we thought, well, if we collect the data, we don't want to have to collect it twice. So this made things really slow. So we moved to a model called reconciliation, which I actually stole the term from Netflix. Um, but what the notion is, is knowing that some of your jobs will fail and then being able to reconcile and go and pick them up and rewrite them. And so what we would do is we'd run all these jobs without transactions, knowing that they would be lossy. And then later in the day, pick up the ones that were missed and write those with transactions. So this is kind of the thinking about base instead of acid, or you know, eventually consistent and being able to support these types of failures within your model. So another thing we did was we batched requests. So I was actually talking to Greg from Blecko, who's sitting in the audience, and he does some stuff similar, though different, but it's the same notion of where you combine a set of operations together and then do one, oper one write or one thing with it. So what you're doing is you're minimizing the total number of operations. So instead of writing you know, 1,000 lines one by one, we would write 1,000 in one batch, uh, batch call. And that was very effective for us, and we saw really big performance gains with that. The other thing we did was we tuned our jobs. So we wrote these really fast, right? I told you we launched this product in six months. The problem with that, well, thankfully, because of that, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit there. So we spent a lot of time with diagrams like this. For those of you building Ruby apps who are not familiar with this, this is a great tool. It's um, generated from Google Perf tools. And it's really great for profiling Ruby code. So we profiled our code a lot, and we saw this, and we were able to make small changes like this and saw massive improvements. This particular change was due to a one-line change in Passenger, because it turned out that garbage collection was just running too frequently. So by changing that, we were able to get a 50% performance improvement for those queries. So the lesson here is know how to profile your code and profile it, because it's a great way to get um, a lot of really interesting data and really understand where your bottlenecks are so you're fixing the right thing. So we also added MD5 hash IDs. So we started off with all of our tables having auto increment IDs. And this was actually really problematic because every time we went to do an insert, we'd have to scan the table. Oops, sorry about that, hit the button. And so this took a long time to insert. So an MD5 hash ID was just hacking, uh, hashing something very unique about the data, like a URL or perhaps a combination of a campaign plus keyword, um, to try and you know, get fast access. But we weren't able to do this for all of our tables, unfortunately. Um, we even hired really fancy consultants to come in and help us. And we had this migration that was 19 hours. They were able to get it down to 16, but it was still too long of an outage for us to actually do it. So we had to keep uh, the auto increment IDs. But does anyone know? Here's my riddle. So I love having riddles in my presentation for those of you who've heard me speak before. Does anyone know what happens when you have 2.1 billion rows in an auto increment ID table? <laughs> it's the limit, right? Like you can't, there's no more key space. This actually took us several days to figure out when it happened. Because uh, it's just weird. It's non deterministic. And some things are failing and some things aren't. And it's weird errors. Uh, so the lesson here is don't use auto increment IDs because when your table gets too big, you're not gonna be able to change it. So this is something we don't use anymore. It's kind of a bad word. I would suggest anyone else doing it migrate now while you still can. Um, and so this was enough to get us where we were um, operational and we weren't answering pagers anymore and we were able to get all of our jobs completed in 24 hours. And so it's at this point, a lot of people often ask me, Kate, your team like had a sucky life for six months and I said, yeah, it really sucked. And people are like, do you really think you should have launched? And the answer is yes, because in that six months, we saw the biggest growth our business had ever seen. And um, even though I think the team was kind of unhappy, we celebrated, gave everyone iPads. Um, but it, it, was, it was still kind of a rough, rough time and definitely um, a challenge. So here's where we are in our timeline. We've launched, and we've done read, and we've done writes. But here's the thing. Even though we optimized our shitty architecture, it's still a shitty architecture, right? Like, it's not going to scale. <laughs> so we had to take some more drastic steps. So the, um, earlier, actually, but we started the migration into services. And so really moving into a service-oriented architecture. 
when we built this tool, we saw it as just a tool. So we didn't really think about it being as big as it got. And so the first thing we had to think about was, well, our biggest problem was our database was growing so fast. Like we hit 100 gigs in MySQL, we were like, okay, 500 gigs, we're like, wow, it's getting kind of big. One terabyte is when you start kind of having replication problems. 1.5 terabytes, you like, it gets kind of hairy, and over two terabytes, like, it's very hard to do anything with your database. Um, so our crawl data was the biggest offender, and so that was the one we started with. And, and I'll go a little more in detail into the architecture around these things. Um, so we started with that and added that in. That was pretty easy because we already had the fleet of crawlers, so we just abstracted that out into its own service. And so we added that and that helped. However, we were still seeing really high load on our database. And so it was focused on, okay, what do we need to do to reduce load? And so that was the, the keyword service that I mentioned earlier. So if you were able to read the diagrams and you're seeing up front, you probably can. One of the big different, they're actually really similar and um, they look a little different, but they're actually really similar in terms of the architecture, except one big difference. One is powered by Cassandra and one is powered by React or React depending on how you say it. And this was a really big debate. Um, and we're still running both internally, although we're planning to go just to one. We started with Cassandra because it had really great support for paginated queries. But if, you, if every week you're writing a million rows and most of your queries are around those million rows, that made a lot of sense. But we have had an endless number of headaches with Cassandra. Running, I know that other people maybe don't share this pain, but running five terabytes of data where you're constantly deleting and adding um, can have some really interesting side effects. Um, but the debate was something like this, or maybe like this at times. <laughs> um, but So we're now kind of standardizing on one, and our service looks something like this, where you now have the crawl service and the keyword service. There's still some jobs in our jobable. But let me talk to you about some of the, yes? Uh, which one what? Yeah, we're going to standardize on, on React. Mostly because we just uh, had much better operational luck. But I also, I also say we're running in the cloud, so it might be different for other people. So let's talk about some of the common themes that we have in these services, because I think there's some uh, interesting learnings. So one of the things I wish we had done across our whole system was planned um, the interfaces ahead of time. So when we did our crawl service, it was very easy to abstract that out because we had the data coming from somewhere else. With rankings, it wasn't nearly as easy because all of that data was so tightly coupled with the views and the way the controller rendered the code. So one thing we do now is we try to abstract functionality into gems and force really clearly defined interfaces even if it's still one big app. And that's helped a lot in terms of just um, forward thinking and being able to split new functionality onto different servers. Another concept that we have embraced fully is nearline storage. So has anyone here heard of nearline storage? Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, a couple of people. I mean, last like no one had heard of it. Um, so here's the Wikipedia definition, but it's actually a really old computer science concept. And it's this notion of like you have this data that immediately needs to be available, and archival data, and nearline's what's in the middle. And so for us, we really embrace that. So we still have a lot of our interactive data in MySQL. So a lot of the aggregates, a lot of the stuff that you see in overviews. Um, and that renders very quickly and we're able to take advantage of caching. And so for example, stuff that you see here that maybe are like summaries, things that you're rendering all the time. For more detailed data, we have that in a Dynamo-based store, so our Cassandra or our React. And this allows us to take advantage of the key value stores and the nature of the data. So that's what you would see displayed here. And then finally, um, the archival data is all in S3. So users typically only page through their most recent crawl data. You're not looking at stuff, but they like to be able to ask, access like all their historical data. So we move all those files into S3 and allow people to download directly from there, and that works really well for us. So this model has two huge benefits. So one is that we can control how much data lives where. So for like any given user, there's only a set of summary numbers in MySQL, which is a much smaller set of data. For it, each customer, there's a set of crawl data in Cassandra. And then for, you know, S3 kind of grows indefinitely. And it also has different types of SLAs. So for example, they expect their summaries to render really fast. Um, the detail's a little bit slower. And of course, iCarvel people don't mind waiting to download files if it's like all their data. And so we support this with a common architecture where we have an API layer servicing requests, 
the dynamo layer kind of holding all the details, uh, a venting layer managing that, so both the collection and the evolution of that data between different parts, and then finally the archival layer in S3. Another big learning that we experience with services that I'm sure a lot of people know um, is don't flip a switch for deployments. So for our crawl service, we import all the data and then just turn it on. And this was a really probably bad decision in terms of the number of customer issues that we faced. Um, but with our keyword service, we took a different approach and we used the feature flag and it rolled out over two months to all of our customers and this was much smoother and much easier. Overall, it took longer to roll out, but it was a lot less painful. So here's where we are in our timeline. Um, but there's one thing that I haven't really talked about is that if you go and like Google how do you scale Rails or scaling Rails, there's like a ton of suggestions and not many of which I talked about here. Um, so I want to talk about the iterative things that we did too because we actually like went through all those lists and, and we really tried everything. Um, so I have good news and bad news. So some stuff worked and some stuff didn't. I'm an optimist, so I like to start with the bad news and get it over with. So that's what we'll start with first. When you talk about scaling or performance, one of the first things off of anyone's tongue is move your assets, your minimize your JavaScript and CSS and put it on a CDN. Yeah, this didn't help for us at all. <laughs> I think when the problem is like in your database, it doesn't matter if you can transmit that data faster if you can't get to it. Another thing that people kept telling us is, okay, well, why don't you upgrade or change your software? So we started with NODB. We went to MyISAM because it was supposed to be back faster. And then it wasn't with me, so we went back to NODB. And then we, you know, we were on MySQL 5.0, so people said, go to 5.1. So we did, but that didn't help. And then we went to Percona 5.1, and literally we kept doing all this stuff, and it was a lot of effort and a lot of energy, and it didn't really help. <laughs> so those are some interesting anecdotes. Um, so let's talk about the good news, because there was a lot of things that we did do that also helped. So, you know, an asynchronous UI, we built this really fast. This wasn't something we put a lot of effort into initially. But by abstracting all the data that was coming in into these different calls, we were actually able to get much better performance. Well, it actually isn't better performance, because it takes the same amount of time to get the data, but customers, um, felt like it was better. This was actually the biggest impact in terms of the customer issues that reported was these changes. Another interesting thing that we did to make this even better is we added below the fold optimization. So if stuff, would, a lot of our screens are really long with lots of reports and data. And so anything that appeared below the fold, we'd load afterwards. So it was somewhat synchronous in that respect. And Amazon actually does this a lot on their retail website. Another thing that we put a lot of energy into was splitting reads and writes. Um, and this actually had a really big benefit for us. Um, so instead of our web app just talking to the master and the slave sitting there, we used the slave for reading. So for a lot of the reports that we were generating or long documents, this was really fast because there was only reads going on in one database. And so we were able to also take a lot of that load off the database that was really heavy with writes. So we saw a lot of benefits by doing this change, and it wasn't a terribly large one. Another change that we did, and this was actually the most controversial of all the things that we considered, was we partitioned our user base. And I think it was controversial because it really wasn't elegant. You know, it's not the traditional sharding, beautiful. It was really dumb. When people, either if your user ID was in a certain one, you use this one. If it was in a different bucket, you use this one. And literally, we just had two copies of our stack. Um, this worked really well for us and actually has proven to be really useful around like our now rolling deployments. Um, but at the time it was really contentious because it was such a big hack for our system. Um, so the lesson here is that even if it's not pretty, if it works, it's probably okay. Um, because we saw huge performance gains from doing this. So here we are in our timeline. We've done a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, and this is kind of where we are today and what we have. Um, so but we've changed a lot about the way we think about things and the way we do things. So let's talk about where we're headed. So one of the first things, and I love this slide, because it's the 17 things I'm not allowed to do, but we really just have seven. So if you use MySQL, we now use it more like a key value store, and, and Facebook does this actually as well. They use lots of MySQL, and um, it's very much just used in that way, and it tends to be very performant for us, and we can take advantage of a lot of the great caching and um, functionality that's available to you there. 
We also changed our process and how we build software. So one of the things that we learned in this whole thing is that when we build a V1, we don't really know what the V2 is gonna look like. And so we started building V1s first and then a V2. And so we tend to try to do a V1 or a minimum viable product as quickly as, as possible and then build a scalable V2 correctly. So we'll build one and then the other and one and then the other for each of our features. And this has the advantage of A, we don't really over engineer. Um, it means our V1s are usually kind of crappy and bugs and performance issues. Um, but we really can then build the right features for our customers. So it sounds really great, but let me give you some tips if you're gonna try this at home. So the first one is, make sure your management is on board with this ahead of time. Because I think in aggregate, you actually do spend a little more time uh, building. Um, but I think that at the end, you tend to get something that will actually scale the way you need to and be hopefully the right product for your customers. Um, but you need to make sure that your boss is on board. My second tip is make sure that you're resourcing these initiatives correctly. So what I mean by this is that not everyone is suited to do V1 and V2 development. So some people might hear me refer to developers or programmers as V1 or V2, and it's kind of a spectrum, and there are people who can do both. Um, but a V1 person is typically someone who likes to hack it together, who gets things done really quickly. Um, they're the person who can build out a whole feature in a weekend. Um, but they also tend to have things in their code that say like hack or I'm not sure why this works. Um, and so, you know, there's one type of person. And then the V2 person who is the person who to them programming and coding is a craft. They write beautiful code. They're the ones that love test-driven development and code coverage. And not that everyone doesn't, but um, there's definitely something they're passionate about. But these two people working together also tend to be the ones who complain. And, and we started this model initially for people reasons. Because I had uh, a V1 person consistently complained about what I call a V2 person. He's like, so takes him so long. Why does he spend all this time writing all these tests that aren't even necessarily useful? And then the V2 person's like, Marty's code's so sloppy. Can you please get him to fix it? <laughs> Can you make him write tests? You can't make people write tests, right, unless they want to. Um, so resource them the right way. So my third tip is make sure that you're actually tracking your usage. Like the only way this really works and is useful from a business perspective is if you're measuring the hell out of everything you're doing. You have to not just have a tight feedback loop with your customers and look at what's happening, but also around how are your systems performing? Are you CPU bound? Are you IO bound? How fast is your data growing? Um, those are all really important questions to answer because it will help inform and make the right technical decisions for your V2. So to summarize, we basically evolved our way of thinking about products. So one thing we do is we spend a lot more time thinking about our data up front from how it will be queried, from ha what happens if it grows beyond one server, even if we don't think it will, and just asking a lot of really good questions. We spend a lot more time abstracting functionality out into services with clear interfaces that everyone agrees to at the get-go. So in the past, we used to just kind of build shit, and we try not to do that anymore. Um, we also try to think about pre-computation. So I said, you know, we were doing a lot of these counts and various things, so now we try to think about this ahead of time. And even when we have features and a PM suggests like, oh, let's build the Google Analytics that you can slice and dice on any days that you want, we say, well, that might be really slow. Can we like have a set of fixed date ranges? And so we just try to think about things differently that both optimize for performance and these sort of tasks that have bid us before. Um, the other thing is we embrace this V1, V2 thing and know that what we think our customers want and what we think is the right thing and what assumptions we have might be wrong. And so we try to build something very quickly and get feedback and then plan to do it over again better. And most of all, we still try to launch as often as we can. So we're always trying to build new things and add new features for our customers. So where are we now? So we started selling access to our tools in 2007. We launched our first version of our app in 2009. So um, and just to give you some perspective, in 2009 we were doing about 1 million in subscription revenue, and this year we're on target to do 12. So literally we've grown from 1 million to 12 million in two years, uh, mostly because of this way of doing things and building it. So in summary, and by the way, I just like totally love this picture because it's kind of funny, but um, 
I guess the lesson is even if like you hack something together and doesn't work, doesn't mean you can't build a successful business, right? And I, I talk more about business than software because I think it's important to think about things that way. Because um, it's easy to get caught up, oh, we need to be able to scale, we need to be able to do this. Well, you don't need to do that if you don't have customers. Um, so I think there's a lot of really interesting lessons here and definitely experiences that we've had. So in, for more, there's a post on our devlog today with all the details of this presentation, although in written form, which is far more shareable than my crazy slides. Um, so if you want to hear about what I had to write then, or want to hear more about this, you can check it out there. Um, and at this point, I will take questions. I'm done quite early, so. Anybody? Yes? Mm-hmm. With um, the latter approach? Um, well, definitely the flipping a switch was more problematic, um, mostly because when you have lots and lots of data or lots and lots of servers servicing one request, sometimes you don't really understand how things are going to get used or where your bottlenecks are until you reach some amount of scale. And I think with the Dynamo type clusters and the way those query layers work, um, what is the right number of reads, what is the right number of writes, and how many nodes you need servicing those requests can be a bit challenging. And so even though we had all the data already in the system, um, we weren't able to get the sort of throughput that we needed around UI, and so things were really slow. Um, also, when you roll out a service like that, even though you think you get all the interface points, sometimes you don't. So there was a lot of times where we thought um, there was assumptions made that a service would always be available. Like, so in this particular case, when we created a campaign, it was supposed to send a message that said um, to the crawl service, hey, create this new crawl series so you crawl every week. Well, one of the problems that we had was that um, that piece wasn't resilient to failure, and no one really caught that particular piece. And so then when that service was slightly unavailable or Amazon had a network hiccup or something, it became a problem then to communicate to those boxes, and people couldn't set up campaigns. So a lot of weird issues like that. Whereas when we rolled out with a feature flag and we saw it to just a handful of users, we were able to... Um, see those things ahead of time, and it would only impact one or two people, or just the admin accounts, for example, so everyone in the company. And so it was much easier to then address those before it went out to the customers. Yes? We use a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, so we use, um, for tracking, we use everything from, we use Airbrake and New Relic, we use Flume, we have a bunch of our own internal logging. Um, so we have a bunch of different stuff that we use kind of to look at things holistically. We also, um, we use Index for customer service and it's really tightly coupled with a lot of things in terms of how we do reporting and, and stuff like that. So we're able to get a lot of really good feedback from our customers. Yes? Yeah, that's a really great question. So initially, we didn't think about it at all. Um, we just tried to build it really quickly. Um, now we really think about it any time we build something new. Like, if it's new functionality, um, so for example, when we added Google Analytics traffic data, so we part of what we do is we try to help people track the ROI of these efforts, so we, we care a lot about their traffic data and conversions. And so the question was, do we put it in the same database or its own database? And so we put in its own database, even though it's not a server and it's really a service and it's really tightly coupled, but we just kind of think about things differently. Um, we didn't actually start moving things into services till it actually was a problem. So either it was causing too much database load or it was causing the database size. Um, but we definitely now think about everything that we build as what if this had to be a service? So what would be the interfaces? How is it gonna get the data? And then set that aside. Um, but most things we don't build as services until, like even in the V1s, like we're building this new social, or we're launching, a new, it's already launched, a social product. And so um, we were gonna build part of it as a service, so we did build the back end that way, but the, the UI is still tightly coupled, but at some point that might be something different. Yes? Yes, so that's a big part of our V2, because our theory is that um, 
We tend not to cut things as much as I would like, but I guess <laughs> that tends to be the case with most engineers. Like, I feel like we have too much shit around, but um, no, we do do that. And with our V2s, usually in order to justify it, part of the way we do it is we build new functionality and better functionality. So we get a lot of feedback. Um, we, we're big fans of Google Website Optimizer, and we'll often test features that way and things like that. And so it's a great way to kind of actually look at the usability of your product and what people like or don't like. And so doing that really allows us to kind of do it. And we try to add some new functionality with our V2. So that helps us justify the business case of doing it. So when we did like the new ranking service, for example, we added all this historical tracking and things that people couldn't have before. So. Yes. Yes. The which part? Um, some of the ad, like the admin panel to like edit people's stuff. Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Um, it depends. So I think we're a lot more immature than you probably are, Karen, like that. We don't have good admin tools. Yeah, well, we don't have very good admin tools. So we have some, but they're mostly centered around the core app that we built. But for the most part, we still are doing a lot of stuff by hand and a lot of stuff with scripts and not really a good like admin console at this point. Um, that's something we'll probably evolve as we become more mature as an organization. But like I said, it's only been around for two years or a year and a half. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of it. It's just based on user ID. So literally, if you. Yep. It, well, yeah, exactly. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, so that's how we did it, which is kind of interesting because all of our old accounts are on one and all of our new accounts were kind of on the other. but. Why are we continuing with it? Uh, that's a great question. So there was some shared resources in the services, but the reason that we separated the users is that each user's data is actually very unique to them. There's not a lot of sharing in the data, which is really good because we're an analytics platform in a lot of ways. Um, but the thing is, our one one of the partitions, the database was around like several terabytes. So like the replication was really hard. So by able to start completely new with a fresh database and nothing in it, allowed us to at least give really great quality of service to all the new users. But yes, it's not obviously an optimal thing because it's not really scalable. And in order to scale it, you just have to partition again. Um, and I think that's part of the reason it wasn't popular is that uh, it really was a band aid. But it has now helped us a lot because we can deploy to certain users certain things easier. Um, we can maintain software in different ways so we're able to test a lot of new functionality or roll things out differently or run different versions of our app at the same time. But it's definitely, it's a hack. It's still a hack. <laughs> I'm not sugarcoating it and trying to make it look good. But to be honest, like I wish we had done it like two or three months sooner because it would make everything <laughs> so much better. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't a popular decision. Yes. So I was kind of being a little bit facetious. We still do a few here and there, but um, we have so much data in our database, and we still don't have MD5 hashes on some of our tables and things like that, that if you do joins and you do a full table scan with billions of rows, it just it can be very, very inefficient. So we try to. Anytime they show up in our code repository or stuff, it's definitely looked at with a close eye of, is this really necessary or not? And we try to treat it a lot more like a key value store. I think if you don't have billions of lines of data, it's really not a problem. Um, but for us, it presents, and we have a lot of, you know, many, many thousands of users using our stuff, so it becomes very cumbersome very quickly. Yes. Yes. How do we replace a join? Uh, by denormalizing the data into two, and copying it into two places, basically. So, or pre-computing the data elsewhere, not in MySQL and storing that result somewhere. So if you want to look at a data, like that's the whole pre-computation piece of it. 
Anybody, anything else? Yes. Okay, hopefully I'll be able to answer. <laughs> we did it in the application level. Yeah, and we actually didn't do it for all pieces because the app still needed to write, like if people added new keywords or um, made changes to their user settings or what have you. So it still needed some write permission. So mostly around anything that involved reading a lot of the data or was a page that was likely to be hit a lot. We often focus on like what, um, what pages people use the most and how they're using it and try and optimize that data for really fast access where if things are more obscure or people have to click like several things to get to it, um, we don't spend as much time optimizing those. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, thanks everybody. I really appreciate you coming and all the great questions.